All right, let's get started. Welcome to Coding Nomads Speed Training, Coding for Complete Beginners. In this webinar, we're gonna take a look at software engineering and software development from the very beginning. So you think you wanna learn how to code. We think that's a great idea. It's one of the most valuable skills uh, that you can learn today. And it's kind of like the new literacy. It's always a good idea to add a little bit of software development or coding knowledge to your repertoire. Some of the reasons why coding is so good is that it's got an, uh, an ever-growing job demand. It, software engineers have the kind of built-in ability to work remotely should they choose to do so. It's used across all industries. Basically, no matter what industry you think of, you can find some kind of software that uh, needs to be used for that, whether it be geology or finance or marine biology or renewable energy or just business processes. Whatever it is, some kind of software is needed in order to make that work better. Right? So software engineering is really one of these things that you can marry with pre-existing skill sets um, to make you even better at what you currently do. One of the nice things that's common across all of those things with software engineering is a nice high salary. Um, software allows you to solve global problems. There's all kinds of wonderful challenges and problems that, that we're tackling with software to make us more efficient, um, safer, all kinds of good things. And software engineering, of course, is good for your muscles. And by that, we mean your brain muscles. Before we dig too deep, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Ryan Desmond. I've been a software engineer for over 10 years. I've spent five, roughly five of those years as an instructor. And I've spent several years as a digital nomad taking my, my, my job on the road. My coding journey started when I was in my early 20s. I had been traveling for a couple of years and uh, was looking for a skill, honestly, that I could work, that I could take on the, on the road. I, it all started for me when I was living in Costa Rica. I was 20 years old or so, and I was trying to figure out how to make some money. And I was thinking, man, I wish I could, I wish I could just work for my computer. And I've got internet, I've got a computer, but I don't know what to do with it. And that, that's when it popped in my head. Maybe I should try software engineering. So I gave it a shot. I liked it. And then I went to university, spent several years in university, racked up tens of thousands of dollars in student loans. And after leaving university, I went from intern to 100K salary plus in less than three years. So, you know, I say that mainly because I'm not the only one who's done it like that. The, the great thing about software engineering is that once you've got a couple of years of experience, the amount of jobs you can get and the, the amount you can get paid for those jobs is great in both ways. So after several years, I took my job on the road. And while on the road, I met so many people who basically just said, man, I wish I could do that. I wish I could work remotely. I wish I didn't have to go home and go back to work on Monday. And that was kind of where Coding Nomads was born because I thought to myself, you know, I can teach you how, how to do this. It's not that difficult. It just takes some time. So was it easy? Absolutely not. It takes a lot of work, years of, years of effort. Uh, was it worth it? Absolutely. It's by far the best decision I made for my career. And, um, you know, in my life, it's given me incredible economic mobility. And I've gotten to work on a number of really, really cool projects with great teams solving very interesting problems and challenges. So how do we get started? The first thing to figure out is which programming language might be best for you. So the, obviously the first thing that you need to do when you want to start coding is to learn a programming language. And the first, thing, the first kind of decision that we have to understand or figure out, answer, is front end versus back end. And then next we'll talk about what, what type of career you could pursue with these skills. So, when you first get started, you're probably overwhelmed. I was when just the number of languages and technologies there are out there. Where do I even begin? What should I do? Where do I start? What is what's important? What's not? And so in this webinar, we're going to try to tackle that challenge. So let's break it down by front end and back end. So this image here is a very good analogy for the way software works. Basically, front end is like this iceberg is what you can see. It's what's above the water. It's the web applications, websites, anything that you click on, uh, enter text into, read on a web page, anything like that. That's all front end, also known as client side. And then everything behind the front end or with this image here, all the iceberg that's under the water is the back end. And the back end is what powers the front end, but it also is just any technology that either can power a web application from you know delivering all the data, doing all the logic behind the scenes, or it might have nothing to do with a website at all. For instance, there's software in your car, in your microwave, in satellites, you know, in your phone, on your computer. There's software just in everything these days that that has that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with a website. So that's considered back-end engineering. So let's take a better look into front-end. So 
as I mentioned, the front end is also ca called client side. And this is everything that you can see on a screen. This is the web development. This is the websites and the web applications that you interact with when you log on to whatever it might be, uh, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or your favorite news site or your online banking. What you're seeing and what you're interacting with is called the client side. The people, developers who are interested in client side are often kind of design types. They're interested in creating user interfaces and user experiences that you can see and click on. So the type of people who often find themselves in front end or client side development are the creative, imaginative, driven, empathic, curious, and all software engineers must be persistent. But this is for your, your more creative design types who have the technical kind of nature to them, but they're also you know, drawing, painting, visual people who want to do something and then see a result, right? Uh, for, for instance, on the screen. Some pros of front end is, is that it can be considered quicker to, well, it can be considered quicker to learn. It's definitely quicker to see results, right? Because you can do something and immediately see it on the page. And you have the ability to build websites and web applications when you know the client side technologies. The, the downsides or the cons here is that for new developers, uh, especially people coming through boot camps, is that the boot camp grad market is pretty saturated. There's now dozens and or hundreds of courses that are, that are teaching these skills. So you've got a good bit more competition as an entry level person. So what are some major technologies with front end? So HTML definitely is a hypertext markup language. And this is just markup. And markup basically just means where something sits on a page. For instance, I want this box to sit you know, in the top left corner of this page. The way that you do that is that you mark up the page and you add a little HTML element saying this is that I want this element to appear here, right? The HTML has no logic involved. And something that you'll see oftentimes is that people will get a little upset when you call HTML a programming language because it's not a programming language. It's a markup language. And the reason it's not a programming language is that there's no logic involved. There's never any variables or any conditional statements. There's no uh, programming. There's just markup. So markup meaning I've got this element that I want to sit on the page right here and it doesn't change, right? Until you add a programming language behind it that can maybe manipulate it. Then we've got CSS. So CSS means cascading style sheet. And this just adds style to your HTML. So you can do in, in HTML, you can style things in line, meaning for this one paragraph, I want to have this one specific style. But the moment you have multiple paragraphs or multiple elements in your HTML page that you want to have the same style, instead of rewriting that style in every element, you'll create a CSS file. And in that CSS file, you'll have, for instance, the styles that you want for a paragraph. And then anytime you use a paragraph in your HTML, it'll have those styles. And I can show you a quick example of that. Bootstrap is something, <clears throat> is a CSS library that is used to simplify styling. And uh, you know, it simply said, Bootstrap is just a big collection of CSS that somebody else wrote. It originally came out of Twitter but you can import it into your project and just use all of these styles. So if you want to make drop downs and you know, hover actions and, or like hover styles, I should say, and all, all of these things that'll make your website look fancy and modern, um, you can use Bootstrap to do that really, really quickly. And then you can still modify Bootstrap, but Bootstrap is really just like a CSS file or a collection of them that you can import into your project so you don't have to write all that CSS from scratch. And then we get into JavaScript. So JavaScript is a programming language. And it adds logic and oftentimes motion to HTML and CSS elements. So when you, when you put HTML, CSS, and JavaScript together, those three skills right there make you a client-side or front-end developer, right? When you start building on top of that, you'll start getting into things like jQuery, Angular, and React. And there's several other frameworks. But jQuery is just a simple JS library that, that simplifies many things that you have to do uh, with JavaScript, such as um, manipulating the DOM or or do, um, domain object model. So when you need to manipulate things on the page or, or make Ajax calls, so Ajax is for when you need to, to call some remote service to do something, right? When you use jQuery, it makes doing those things a bit easier. Angular is a, is a, J, a JavaScript framework which adds even more complexity and allows you to do things such as dependency injection, which is a com more complex topic that you'll learn about later, but it basically gives you the ability to write more complex JavaScript applications. And then React is a framework that, generally speaking, is used for creating complex UIs using reusable components. So if you've got a, a big application that does lots of things, um, that's got many, many pages, and you don't want to have to rewrite the same um, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript 
again and again, you can basically create components using React and then reuse those components. And again, these are Angular, React, and jQuery. These are kind of level two, level three um, technologies that you learn once you already know core JavaScript and you've already gotten pretty comfortable with HTML. CSS is kind of a plus, just makes your stuff look nicer. And then you learn JavaScript. And then once you've got those things, you can start moving into jQuery, Angular, React. And then you'll oftentimes see things like Mean or Mern or there's several other. These are just JavaScript stacks um, or web application stacks. And the Mean stack means Mongo, which is a database, Ember, Angular, React, and or React, and Node. And this is basically just means that this is a stack of technologies that oftentimes goes into the development of a complex web application. right? So um, look, we can go ahead and take a quick look at uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript really briefly. So I'm going to open up a command line here. I don't think I've been muted there. Um, and let's go ahead. So a command line is, as a, as a Java developer, something that you, not as a, as a software developer, something that you use on a, on a daily basis. right? So getting comfortable with the command line, we don't really mention here in this webinar client-side versus server-side software engineering. But both, all software engineers, they use the command line pretty frequently. And it just takes a little getting used to. The command line is a, basically a direct interface with the operating system without any UI. Right? So I'm gonna, let's go ahead and look at a very simple HTML page. So I'm going to say vim heading.html. This is just a text editor from the command line. I could open this with, a, um, with my re regular UI, too. So I could say, for instance, This, again, is just a text editor. This is just a text file. But I'm going to be interacting with it through the command line here. So this just says that I'm an HTML file. This is where the HTML starts. This is the body of the HTML. And then I've got this header here. H1 is just a preset HTML heading. And then this is where the body ends. And this is where the HTML ends. So when I open that, it'll open as an HTML page in my web browser. And it'll show this as a heading. right? I can then style that. So let's look at uh, blue heading. And here, so I've got basically the same exact HTML, but in, but in this one is new because we added a style. And this is called an inline style. Um, basically, it's just saying that I want this one header to be blue, right? And that's it. So when I open that, we've got a blue heading. And I, I want to do a quick shout out to w3schools.com because all these basic components for HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and so many other. They've just got these wonderful pages that have very clear and concise documentations where I pulled several of these. I use it all the time when I need a quick reference on something. So W3 Schools is great. So we've got this blue heading, which basically gave us a, added a style to our HTML page. Now let's look at, at, at CSS. So let's look at with borders.html. So here it's a slightly different, um, but you can see that we've now got a style tag. And a style tag is where you would put CSS. And inside the style tag, we have a P. And this P means paragraph. For paragraph elements, you want it to have this style, right? So that down here now, when we get into the, and we do these kind of in the same file uh, CSS scripts, we put it in the head tag of an HTML file. Then once the head tag is over, we open up the body tag. That's where the body of the HTML, HTML will go. We've got a simple heading. And then we have three paragraphs. Right? So each one of these P tags means paragraph. And this means where a paragraph starts and a paragraph ends, right? when we have the, back, the backslash before or the forward slash before it. But up here in our style section, we've defined a style for all P tags. Right? We can see this P right here. So now when I open this, we can see that, that we have kind of a unique styling that's around each paragraph. And the reason we do that is that we don't, as programmers, we don't ever want to write the same code or markup or CSS twice, right? We only want to write something one time. And so when we, with this, we can just write this style one time. And no matter how many times we use a P tag or create a paragraph, it'll have that style. And this helps our code become more reusable, more maintainable, just makes it better across the board. And this kind of DRY, don't repeat yourself, is a, is, a, is a mantra that we repeat in programming all the time because it's very, very easy to just kind of write the same code over and over again. But that's a problem that we, all, that we learn to avoid because when it comes time to change something, update something, maintain something, 
when it's written in four or five or 10 or 20 different places, it's a big headache. And when it's written in one place, it's very, very simple because I can, you know, if I want to change the border on my P tags, I can just go to one place. Let's say I need to make it a little thicker, make it two pixels. And when I do that, now my, my uh, borders are a little bit thicker than they were before. Right? So we'll, let's also take a little look at JavaScript. So let's see, Vim Simple.js. And Vim is just a text editor. So here, now I've got a script in my HTML file. And this is just gonna, I've got this, it's gonna say window.alert five plus six. So, and this is just to demonstrate that it's going to do something and then it has logic involved, right? So HTML and CSS don't have the ability to hold variables or to kind of make something happen on the page, whereas JavaScript does. So when I open up this, open simple.js, you see that I get this pop-up and the number 11 here. And the number 11 is just to demonstrate that five plus six worked, right? So JavaScript gives functionality, logic, mo movement, variables, con control to your web page, to your, to your HTML and CSS. You can, uh, another example of HTML is uh, using variables. So here again, I've got this little script tag and you can put these script tags right into your HTML. Um, and it says, it basically tells the, the computer or the web page that this is not markup. This is not something that I want to appear on the page. This is a script. And so here we're creating a couple of variables, var x equal five, var y equals six, var z equals x plus y. And then we're saying document.getElementById demo. And that means this right here. So on this P, we, we gave it an ID and, we, and that ID is demo. You can give any L HTML element an ID and then you can reference it from other places, which is what we're doing here. So we're getting this element called demo and we're gonna put inside of it this value. The value of Z is, and then the variable Z. So let's give that a run and take a look. And it worked. So the value of Z is 11. So this just demonstrates using JavaScript to insert logic, variables, a little bit of control, maybe some motion, an alert box, for instance. JavaScript gives you the ability to, to add logic and control to your HTML and CSS. So I'll go ahead and close these down. So now let's talk about backend. So AKA server side. The backend is much like that image we saw earlier, is the all the iceberg that you don't see under the water. So these are for people who are interested in working with data, um, building complete products. Oftentimes the personality types here are kind of analytical, logical, organized, detail-oriented, flexible potentially. So these are people who rather than build or design a nice looking web page, would rather build and design some um, kind of data architecture capable of ingesting and analyzing, you know, tens of millions of pieces of information and coming up with some kind of you know, assumption or result based on that information. They like systems, they're interested in, in kind of more of an infrastructure application architect kind of idea rather than something that, rather than the more design, um, you know, visual feedback loop of a, of a client side, the, your backend developers are more, you know, they just like working with data, building systems, creating these complex kind of environments where lots of, thing, lots of things can happen and appear to be happening relatively simply. So, the pros for backend development is that the job market demand is significantly larger. So, and this is because a website is a form of software, absolutely, but not all software is a website, and not in any way. So again, a website is a form of software, but not all software is a website, right? There's, and just by, if I had to guess, I would say maybe, maybe 10 to 20% of the world's software today has something to do with the, a website, right? Because there's software in everything. Um, if you look around your house or, your car or the city that you're driving through or whatever it might be, there's software in everything. And so all the, all the software that has nothing to do with a website and it, you know, sometimes backend software still does interact with websites or web services, but if it's not related to a web page, it's generally considered to be backend. And so because of this, there's just far more jobs in backend or server side development than there, than there is in client side development that more and more and more services are going um, kind of to this, SaaS model or this cloud model where their software is available through some kind of web app interface or web application. So there is some client side kind of development that goes into that, but 90 plus percent of the application will still be driven by the server side. 
some cons to, and so, to, to, you know, in my experience, for instance, at, at a number of companies, we'll say I'm working with a group of 20 software developers in this company, probably 15 or so would be server side engineers and, you know, three to five would be client side or front end developers or engineers, right? Because the, the amount of work oftentimes needed on the back end of a system, just like that iceberg shows is much, much larger than a front end. So larger job market. The cons is that it can take a little longer to master and it's got a bit of potentially of a steeper learning curve just because there's more things to deal with, right? It, with client side, you're looking with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So you know, that's what I need to learn and this is what I need to figure out in order to build these web applications. Whereas with backend services, there's just more going on, more things that you need to understand, more complexity with deployment and servers and so on and so forth. So some of the major technologies with backend or server side development are Java, Python, PHP, Ruby, Node.js, um, which is kind of JavaScript's foray into backend development. Um, it's basically a server-side JavaScript environment that runs JavaScript instead of Python or Java or any of the others. C is a very old but very fast language uh, that is actually still used oftentimes in like lower level development such as the Linux kernel um, embedded systems. Uh, C++ is also an older language that's widely used for game development because it, because it allows programmers to manually manage memory. So it's a longer story, but basically gamers use C++ or game developers use C++ so that the background environment, let's say, of a video game doesn't disappear automatically uh, when it shouldn't, which could happen, for instance, with Java because Java has an automatic garbage collector. Um, so Java, you know, the garbage collector in Java might come through and start erasing things that are still being used in the game. But, you know, for instance, when the player turns around, you know, in a, some kind of role player game, the background or the environment that they're in, when they turn around, in a, if it was coded with Java, it might not be there anymore because Java might have thought it's no longer being used. Whereas C++, you have to, the, the programmer has to manually, in the code, will manually let go of that memory. Um, C Sharp is basically just Microsoft's version of Java. And then we've got all the databases, MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, Teradata, IBM, there's a bunch of them. Um, and they're all different, but more or less the same. Once, once you know one good relational database technology, um, such as MySQL, which is where I would recommend to start, you kind of, you know, the learning curve on, on picking up any other database is maybe an hour or two, because they're, they're, they're all so similar. So to digress a little bit, Java is by far the world's most um, widely used programming language. It's just been around forever. It's regularly updated. Um, so even though it was originally developed in the mid 90s, it's as modern and uh, relevant today as it was then. Python is the world's fastest growing language in terms of popularity. It's very popular for the data science, uh, machine learning kind of types. Um, not, that, not because you can do anything specific in Python that you can't do with Java or, or any of the other languages on the server side, but it's just that the community around uh, that, you know, data science and machine learning, et cetera, ha has kind of opted to use Python. And one of the reasons for this is because Python is generally considered to be one of the easiest server side languages to learn. It's kind of elegant, you know, it doesn't, the same amount of code, and I'll demonstrate this in a little bit, the same amount of code, let's say a Java application takes 30 lines of code. In Python, you could do that same thing in maybe 15, right? So I think that's the general reason why a lot of the statisticians and just math types and quant types, you went with Python because they're not trying to be software engineers, they're trying to do data science, right? So they picked that, the easiest server-side language to use and to work with, which is oftentimes considered to be Python. PHP is the kind of this uh, wonderful web development language. You can actually embed PHP right into your HTML pages, uh, but PHP executes on the server side. So it's kind of like this bridge language that allows you to build complex web applications relatively quickly. And then Ruby, again, is a, is a, is a nice language that's oftentimes, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of like there's, there are lots of big companies that use Ruby, um, but oftentimes I see Ruby as kind of a prototyping language where, where people can build interesting, unique, complex web applications relatively quickly. But then when they start scaling into larger organizations, people usually leave Ruby behind and go with Java or Python, PHP, and others. So, um, and there's a bunch more. I put down here Scala, Cloture, Erlang, Haskell, Perl. There's a number of server-side languages that all kind of serve their own use, right? So Scala is a, a language that was written by some math PhDs, I think, in England a decade ago because they wanted to use Java and they wanted to use the JVM, the Java virtual machine that Java runs in, but they didn't, but they needed a language that was more suited for science and math and equations and that kind of stuff. So they actually created a new language called Scala. And 
all, a lot of these other languages, they're kind of specific languages and they're kind of tier two or tier three languages. So as a, as a software engineer who's just getting started, I would, and, and you're interested in server side, I would highly, highly recommend that you go with Java or Python right now. Um, I'm obviously a little biased because at Coding Nomads we teach both Java and Python, but we teach Java and Python for a reason. They're so widely used, so popular, and so versatile. Uh, PHP is a great language to learn. You know, all of these are really great languages to learn. Uh, but I would say right now in the, if, if I was, you know, talking to a friend and they were saying, where should I start? I would definitely give them something on the left side of the screen. I would say Java or Python, uh, potentially Node. It would be my number three here. These older languages are just, you know, they're just not, they're still used, but they're just not as widely used. And C Sharp, if you're going to learn C Sharp, you might as well learn Java because um, it's just Java's, the, basically C Sharp is just Microsoft's closed source version of Java. So what are some of the careers that require coding skills? Entrepreneur, QA engineer, tech support, testing engineer, business analyst, project manager, product manager, scrum master, team lead, and obviously software engineer. So. Uh, I've met all kinds of people, for instance, um, that work in marketing that learned coding because they wanted to learn how to automate a bunch of these marketing processes. Because just because you uh, learn, you know, the idea that when you learn coding, you have to go straight into this, I'm going to sit in a dark room and do nothing but code all day and build these huge complex systems is not necessarily true at all. Sometimes it's just, I need to learn how to code so I can write some nice short scripts that will automate some of these tasks and save me several hours a day, right? And that script might be 20 lines long and that's it. But because you have these coding skills, you're able to do that, right? You're able to spend 20 minutes writing this little script that will do something automatically for you that would have taken you two to three hours. Let's say you need to go through and modify an Excel file and send everyone an email based on an email address in that file, something if they have, if this particular box isn't checked. You could go through there and do that manually for the next three hours, or you could write a script that takes you 20 minutes and then run that script and the script goes through the entire thing in 30 seconds, right? So, Coding just gives, makes you better at what you're already doing, which is really nice kind of attribute about coding. So what's it really take to go from beginner to coder? Let's take a look. Here we have what I consider to be the most important aspects of a software developer, right? And the number one thing is, well, the, the two most important things are motivation and persistence. And then you have to add in that time factor. But it's, I've found in teaching people how to code for the last several years that the level of internal motivation is by far the most important and deciding factor that determines the success or failure of that person or of that project, right? When someone is inherently motivated to learn this, it, they'll write some more code and finish that tutorial instead of pulling up Netflix. They'll spend three to four to six or more hours a day reading through documentation and doing tutorials and watching videos rather than giving it maybe one hour or two every couple of days you know, on and off, right? There's a huge difference there. And it's the person that's, get, that's super motivated that's going to win that battle, right? And I've seen it again and again in teaching people. Some students, um, you know, they're just so motivated that, but, you know, in between every one of our conversations, They've done all of this work. They've done all. They, they've got. They've done all this research on their own. They went and did this extra work. They did three extra challenges that they didn't need to do because they're hungry and they're motivated and they're really serious about learning how to code. Those people just they learn, and it's really neat to watch them go from zero to coder in a matter of months, and then oftentimes go off and get jobs, which is just the neatest thing. With time, obviously, a, a minimum of three to six months of consistent studying for an internship or entry level job, and. Three would be very, very quick. I, our courses, we run an in-person course that's four months long, and it's about for server side for Java and Python engineering. And I would say four months is just the bare minimum um, to get you up to, and that's it's a very intense program to get you up to kind of entry level ready, right? And some students, depending on that motivation factor, might need a couple more months after one of our long courses to to really get there. Persistence is in terms of skills that a software engineer has or attributes, qualities of a software engineer, persistence is the most important skill because very few things work or even make sense on the first or even 10th attempt, right? So I can tell you personally that I've spent days working on single bugs, on single problems, where it seems so simple, everything is exactly the way it should be, but it just doesn't work, right? And you think, okay, well, I'll spend five or 10 minutes and fix it, but that doesn't work. Okay, I'll spend the next hour or two fix it, okay, but it doesn't work. All right, I'm just going to work on it till lunch. But by lunch, it's still not fixed. Three, four, five days later, you can still be working on that same problem. Hopefully not, but but it but it happens, and I've, it's happened to me. And 
persistence, just this idea that I'll try everything, I'll read everything, I'll Google everything, I'll just try and try and try and try, modify, redirect, reroute, change it again, try it again, over and over and over and over again until it works. And that's all software engineers, no matter how much experience they have, they go through that same process, right? And so that having that persistence mindset where I'm just gonna do this until it works, no matter what, is what kind of separates people who, whose systems work and whose don't, right? It's not because anyone's any smarter. I mean, obviously, intelligence and, and proficiency are important, but it's persistence that will make the difference, right? And so, obviously, you, proficiency is, in, is, is something you just have to have, but by proficiency, you really just need to know the basics because every software ap application I've ever built or job I've ever had or project I've ever worked on has been different, right? There's been different languages, different tech stacks, different, everything that you need to work with. And so you're always starting as a beginner, oftentimes on new projects. Um, no matter, even if you have 10 years of experience or 20 years of experience, you'll work on a new project and there'll be something you've never done before. Um, what's important at that point is that you know the basics. You understand how the, the general landscape of software engineering, how it all lays out so that you know from where to build, right? So under, getting those basics, becoming proficient in programming, um, pick your language, right? Because there's also this kind of, concept that programming is just a matter of programming, right? So it doesn't matter, and I'm gonna demonstrate this in a little bit, whether you're coding in PHP or Java or Python, it's all the same thing that you're doing, it's just a slightly different syntax. So once you know the general basics, you can very quickly kind of grow on those in any direction that you need to for the, for the task at hand. Confidence, it's just really important, right? Because if you don't believe in yourself, whether it's in the learning process or at, on the job or in this project, uh, you're gonna have a really hard time succeeding. So some, a, a hint or a tip that I could give people is that even the most confident software developers who've been at it for 10 or 15 years are Googling stuff every single day. They're getting stuff wrong over and over and over again. Sure, it might, they might, have, it might be a bit easier or quicker for them to do kind of simple tasks, but everyone gets confused. Everyone is overwhelmed when they're learning this stuff. Nobody just gets it on the first try. And anyone who says they did is lying, right? It takes a lot of persistence, a lot of repetition and redundancy learning and learning and learning, you know? So while you're in that process, don't let, don't get down on yourself. Don't, don't, don't lose your confidence. Just keep pushing forward, right? And then lastly, at the end of the day, um, you, you need to develop these skills, this ability to solve problems for companies using software. It's at that point when you can be more of a benefit than necessarily the company is to you, where, where a company says, where, where you're actually at the level that somebody, that a company can pay you to build them something um, is when you're ready for a job, right? Because a company isn't looking to take somebody on just so they can teach them. They're looking to bring someone on because that person can help them succeed, can help their company be more successful. And so that's kind of the, uh, oftentimes people ask, when will I know when I'm ready to apply for jobs? And, and it's just kind of this understanding or this knowledge that when you get to a point where you're like, I really could help companies build so software. You know, after you've been studying for three, six plus months, you, you start to get into this understanding that, you know, no matter what it is that I need to do, I can now kind of figure it out, right? And it's at that point when that you kind of realize that you now have the ability to help companies build things. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the, you know, everybody's Googling. So the two states of every programmer, and this could not be true, when you get something working, you're like, oh my God, I'm a God, you know? It, you feel just amazing. And oftentimes there's hooting and hollering and jumping up and down, or at least standing up for a minute and doing some, some fist pumps or something, because you feel really good after you spent a week working on something and all of a sudden it just works, right? When, when that's not the case, you're more like the picture on the right where you have no idea what you're doing. This, is, this couldn't be more true. And you can oscillate between these two states in a mere matter of seconds, right? Um, and this is super normal. Everybody that, every, every coder that I've ever worked with, everybody that I've ever helped learn to code, uh, and myself included, all go back and forth between this kind of the two states of every programmer, which is I'm so smart, I, I can figure anything out, and this it works and it's all perfect. And then 10 seconds later, you realize there's a massive bug and you have no idea how to fix it. And so you go into that, I have no idea what I'm doing category. Um, so what about working remote, right? Oftentimes, myself included, we got into software engineering because of the dream, I wanna work remote. I wanna work on the beach, um, which I say kind of with air quotes because no one actually works on the beach. So how, how to prepare for going remote? One of the easiest ways to get a job that's remote is get hired, you know, seek out companies that only hire remote. Find a small startup that doesn't even have an office. Find a, I often, I, I gear entry level people towards startups oftentimes because 
a startup of five to 10 people, or let's say anything under 20 to 30 people, oftentimes has a lot they need to do and not a huge budget. So they can't even afford a full-time experienced software engineer if they wanted to. So if the right person reaches out to them saying, hey, I'm entry level, but I'm super motivated, very driven, I've been studying for six months, and here's my portfolio, here's projects, here's examples of things I can do, you know, they might say, you know, this sounds like a great, great, great opportunity here. And so another thing you can do is just get a job, let's say you live in Denver, get a job out of a company in New York, right? Because off, many, many, many software companies are very open to hiring remote developers, right? Um, all you need to do is dial in once or twice a week to kind of the, to the team meetings, and then you have you know, regular check-ins with your manager, but you can be in Denver and work for a company in New York. Um, so by getting that job in, that's in a place where you are not, you're inherently remote. Um, the other one is to start on site and transition to remote. This is actually what I've done more often in, in my kind of work remote experience is that I'll start with a company and then after several months or maybe even longer, um, I'll just kind of transition into more of a remote position. And that's, so this is good because it allows you to really, really get to know the company, get to know the software, get to know your coworkers, your managers, everything. And then you can kind of just, you know, depending on how your relationship there, but you know, what I've done is basically just said, I'd like to go remote <laughs> and, then, and they've always said yes. And then one of the most important things you can do is seek companies that have mentorship. Um, if you are an entry-level developer and you're working remote and, you're, and you don't have any mentorship or any other people to work with, it can be a pretty sad and lonely and difficult place, right? Because you're, you have these huge you know, tasks and challenges in front of you and you don't know what you're supposed to do and you don't have any guidance and it's just kind of you on your own. And I made this mistake a couple of times early in my career where I was working on uh, by myself, basically remotely without much mentorship. And it was very difficult. So seeking companies where there's mentorship, whether even if that mentorship is remote, one of the best mentors I ever had lived in Germany and I lived in San Francisco and we would chat a couple times a week, but the, you know, his mentorship, my, my skills and my ability increased greatly because of his mentorship. And when I was lost or stuck or whatever, I could always reach out to him and he would point me in the right direction. And it's so helpful to have that mentorship. Things to expect when for working remotely is you need to pitch your own clients and handle your own contracts. So you're not, you know, as a, when you're working remote, you have to be, you have to hustle a little more in, in, in finding your work, right. And managing that work and kind of being your own boss. You have to demonstrate proficiency, the proficiency as well as autonomy. You know, you have to be able to hold yourself accountable, actually get the work done all day, every day and be your own boss. So handle your invoicing, your insurance, your taxes and so forth. So it, when you're working remotely, especially as a contractor, there's more things that you need to think about, manage, um, than if you're just working for another company where a lot of all that stuff is just handled for you. So here's the expectation of working remote, right? Um, everyone thinks they're just going to be in the sun, working by the beach. But in reality, you don't want to take your laptop anywhere near the beach. Sand will kill your laptop in a heartbeat. And you don't work outside because the glare is way too bright. <laughs> so... Um, this is not the reality. Um, the reality oftentimes looks something more like this. This is actually a picture from one of our previous courses, but it's similar to, to, to what it looks like when you're working remote. And or sometimes it's just you working, uh, you know, at your house from your couch or from your dining room table. But it's much more t times, um, you know, people uh, crowd crowded into a room like this or a cafe or a co-working space working off a laptop, you know, struggling through uh, to get all the stuff that they're trying to get to work. You know, it's not the easiest route at all, uh, becoming a software engineer and or becoming a remote developer, uh, but it's absolutely worth it. So here's a picture of me. This is actually when we were going into the Komodo archipelago, where when, when we had been working in Bali for several months, we took a little trip over to the Komodo Islands and sailed around. It was absolutely glorious. So we've done a lot of talking. Let's jump in and write some code, right? The first thing that we're going to do is a simple hello world, and I'm going to do this in Java. We can kind of pick our our language, but I'm going to come back over here to my command line. And again, this is just a, an interface to our computer um, without any UI, right? So I'm going to go ahead and say PWD, which is print working directory, and I'm going to create a file. So I'm going to say vim hello world.java. And Java has this idea of a class. So I'm going to say public class hello world. And the class name is always the same as the file name that it's in. So we created a file called hello world.java. And inside that file will be a class called hello world. And then I'm going to create a main method, public static void main. And the main method is where every single Java application starts. Uh, it's the, basically the entry point of every single Java application. There are some exceptions, like you can, um, you can 
have it start somewhere else if you do some configurations, but it's super rare. It's not really necessary. Just keep in, you know, the main method is basically the entry point of every Java application out there. And all this main method is going to do is just going to print out to the console um, system without the print line, hello world. And hello world is basically every programmer's first programming language, uh, sorry, first program. It's kind of the quintessential first program that everybody writes. Get out of here. And now that I've got this Java file, I need to compile this Java file. So I'm going to say Java C, Java C is Java's compiler. Um, run that. Looks good. Now I have a class file in here. Class that's just the compiled bytecode that happened. And this is uh, we can talk about this more with Java a bit later, but um, or in one of our courses. But now that I have a class file, I can run that class file and the JVM, Java Virtual Machine, will interpret the bytecode that's in, this, in that class file into machine code and execute those commands. So when I run this, so I'm just going to say Java, hello world, and it's going to print out hello world. So my application ran. So that's our simplest application that we can, that everybody builds in the very beginning. Um, I could do the same thing in Python. I'll say vim, uh, hello world.py. And I'm just going to say, and then I'm going to say Python 3, hello world.py. And it printed out, right? So this is a very simple example also while we're here of just showing you the difference between Java and Python. So if I vim hello world.java, you can see that we had to write all of this code to get this hello world to print. And in Python, I just had to. I just had to write print hello world. So that's a perfect example of Python being a bit simpler. Um, that being said, I actually recommend, highly recommend that people who are just getting into software engineering, especially if they're going to be people that want to be able to use multiple languages, that they learn Java first. And this is because once you learn Java, you know all of this kind of verbose syntax and rules that come along with every programming language. Um, and you kind of you, you get a greater knowledge of the programming fundamentals than you would necessarily with Python. And because of that, you, when, when it comes time to learn Python, Python seems just simple, right? It's, it's just like Java, but it's just simpler. Um, there's all these things that you don't have to do. The inverse is not true, right? So if you learn Python first, um, you know, the, the learning curve of learning a programming language is still there. It's a little bit easier than it is with Java. But after, let's say you already know Python, now you want to go learn Java, you, you're looking at everything like, what is all of this? You know, it makes Java seem much, much harder than Python. Um, so that's why I recommend to learn Java first, because then when you go to other languages like Python and others, you see why Python and them are a bit easier to write, and you understand what rules they're, you know, so Python basically will manage a lot of the, the code that you have to write in Java. It'll just kind of interpret or in, like implicitly figure out what's happening. For instance, in Java, we have to declare variables for their data type, like int, double, float, these are all different data types in Java. Whereas in Python, we don't do that, right? It just, it can, it can it, you can kind of automatically or implicitly understand what data type you're working with. So a um, little, little quick back and forth in Java and Python there. Now let's look, let's create something a little more uh, interesting. So we're going to create a little game in um, Java and Python. And this game is going to be called Guess My Number. And so I'm just going to clear this up here. So we're going to say vim guess my number dot java and this is going to be a class called guess my number and inside this class we're going to have again a main method the main method always has this exact same syntax and then inside here the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take in some, so a lot, and I just want you to know that this, I expect this to be a bit confusing if you're just getting started, but I just want to show you real programming. And so there's going to be several things in here that you're like, what is that? Why do we use that? So on and so forth. This is, these are things that we, you know, in one of our courses, for instance, we dig much deeper into, but for right now, I'm just going to demonstrate it. So the first thing that we want to do is take in um, some input from the user. This is going to be a number, it's going to be a game where, where the user guesses the number that we are holding in our in memory. Right, so um, I'm going to say scanner, scanner, or let's call it keyboard equals new scanner, and this is going to take in as an argument system 
dot in. And that basically just says when somebody type, you know, you get prompt, you get asked a question on the console and it wants you to type something back, that's system dot in. The next thing that we're gonna do is create a count because we're gonna track how many attempts it took. Then we're gonna create a random number. Um, and I'll use some comments here. So in Java, we can do inline comments by doing a little slash slash. So this is gonna be get a random number between one and 100. And it's kind of a funky little syntax here, but I'm gonna say there's several ways you can do it, but um, this is just kind of the, And so there's some funky syntax there, but that basically says that I'm gonna get a number between one and 100. And I can verify that. Then um, we're gonna just create a variable that's gonna hold the user's guess. And I'm just gonna set it to zero as a default value. Um, so then I'm gonna print out some dialogue to the user saying system.out.println. Um, I'm thinking of a number. between one and 100. Can you guess what it is under five attempts, let's say. Or let's just say, can you guess what it is for now? And then I'm gonna start a loop. And I'm gonna say while guess does not equal a and why don't we go ahead and start guess at i'm going to start guess at negative one so that in case they actually guess uh just to make sure there's never a that this while loop will enter at least once so while guess does not equal a and this is a bool, what we what is called a boolean condition whether guess which is a variable currently holding negative one and a which is a variable co currently holding some number between zero and or one and 100 right so while guess does not equal A, so this will be a true or false Boolean condition, um, enter this while loop and do something. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say guess equal keyboard dot next int, and that's gonna get the next input from the user that's hopefully an int. This would require some um, data validation and exception handling out there in the real world in case they entered like an H instead of a four. But, and then we're going to increment count because we want to check how many times they've guessed. And then we're going to say, if guess is greater than A, we're just going to print out um, system.out.println um, guess lower. I'm gonna close that if block, and I'm gonna say else if guess is less than a, I'll just copy this. But this time they're gonna guess higher. And if it's not lower and it's not higher, that must mean it that they won, right? So. In Java, we have these curly bra brackets which create blocks of code, right? Um, here we can actually, once they finish this while loop, we could just, because when, when guess does equal A, it'll exit this while loop, and then we can print out that they won. System.out.println. Congrats, you guessed the right number. And then we could go ahead and just, let's say what that number was. So this is just formatting. I'm gonna print out the variable A in parentheses. Um, in, and then we'll tell you the number, of, the number of attempts they did in, oops. So a little confusing, a lot going on here, but this is a, this is a, a Java game programmed, uh, a guess my number name, name programmed in Java, programmed in Java. So let's give it a run and let's see if it works. So I'm gonna exit out of here. 
And I'm gonna say Java C, guess my number. Ooh, ooh. I got an error. So not a statement, else guess expected, else if guess is less than A. Oh, I need to import java.util.scanner. Public class get, oh, got my, got my, so that's a problem because my class name is not the same as my file name. So see what's happening? Like I've been doing this for a long, long time. And even when I'm doing it, a little error here, a little error there, just fix it, fix it, fix it. It never works on the first try. But it works on the third try. So now let's run it. So Java, guess my number. Um, that's all I have to run. So it says, I'm thinking of a number between one and 100. Can you guess what it is? Let's start with 50. Guess higher, 70. Guess higher, 90. Guess lower, 80. Guess lower, 75. I got it. I guessed the right number is 75 in five tries. And we can just run it again. So let's start with 50 again. Guess higher, 60, 70, 80, 90. 88, 85, 83, 84. Got it. We guessed the right number, which was 84 in nine tries. And that's our first Java application. Guess my number. And so let's we can go ahead and take a quick look at it again. But basically, all it does is we have this main method, which is where the application starts by default. We create a scanner, which takes the which which will allow us to take in input from the user. We, we create a count because we just want to count how many attempts. This is just a variable we'll use later to count how many tries that it took them. We create a random number. We use a comment right here so that uh, comments are ignored by the compiler and by the JVM. So we can just write comment, comments and documents and stuff in here. We created a random number between 1 and 100. Um, we, we created this guess variable, which is going to hold the user's guess. But we set it to negative 1 right away because we want to make sure that this while loop enters. Um, before we enter the while loop, we print out to the user, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100. Can you guess what it is? And then we start this while loop. And we're going to continue to loop in this while loop until guess equals A. And remember, A is that random number that we created. And guess, the first thing that we do is we ask the user keyboard.nextint. So we take whatever um, input the user put in, and we assign that to the variable guess. We increment count, because now they've guessed at least once. And on the next time, it'll be 2. And on the next time, it'll be 3. If guess is greater than A, we, we tell them to guess lower. If guess is less than A, we tell them to guess higher. And then once they've guessed and, um, and once, it, once guess does indeed equal A, like 84 or 75, whatever it is, it'll exit this loop, which, and it'll print out this line, which is congrats. You passed, you guessed the right number, which was A, in the, the variable count tries. And that's it, that's Java programming. So now, just for fun, let's do the same exact thing in Python. So I'm going to say vim guess my number dot py. And so this is going to be a little simpler, as Python generally is. But the first thing we're going to do is say import random, which is going to, which is the package that allows us to to get random numbers. Then I'm going to say num um, equals random dot rand int between 1 and 100. Again, simpler. Um, then I'm going to create this guess variable. And I'm just going to basically set it to nothing right now, set it to none. And then I'm going to say while guess does not equal num, I'm going to tab over once, guess equals input. So this is going to get something from the user. Um, guess a number between 1 and 100. Then we're going to actually say uh, we're going to cast, just so we have the right data type, um, int guess. Then we're going to say if guess equal equal num, we're just going to print um, congrats, you guessed the right number. This one's, we're, it's simpler all around too, even with our interactions. Um, and then we're gonna exit by, we're gonna exit this whole loop by using the break keyword. Then um, if it, 
guess does not equal num. We have to do an else if, but in, jo in Python, that's elif, which is just a an abbreviation of else if. So we're going to say if guess is less than num, we're going to print guess higher. Elif guess is less than, uh, sorry, greater than num. Print guess lower. Right, and that's it. Now we're done with our Python application. So you can see it is indeed a bit simpler. It's a bit more kind of elegant. Java is a bit more verbose. Um, so let's go ahead and see if we can run this. So with, with remember we ran the Java program by saying Java, which tells, which says we want to use the Java um, program or programming language and the JVM to run this guess my number. In this case, we're going to say Python and specifically Python three, guess my number dot pi. So guess a number between one and one hundred. Let's go with fifty. Guess higher, seventy. Guess lower, sixty. Guess higher, sixty-five. Guess higher, sixty-eight. I got it in five tries. So th this is just shows you that programming is really just a text file that you run with a, with either Java or a Python interpreter, um, and it's really just a set of instructions that will continue to do something until until you until they meet some 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 condition that you, um, at which point you can tell it to stop. And so let's just go again, look at, um, you know, here is this guess my number. This is just a text file. I've been doing it in the terminal just because, you know, it's a bit simpler all in one place there. But you can write this Java, you can write this Python application right here in a text file. Really, really quickly, I want to show you guys, um, you know, when, when we start getting into software development, people start talking about IDEs, like IntelliJ or PyCharm. So let's just go ahead and run these same applications in IntelliJ and in PyCharm. So give this a second to load up. In the meantime, see what else we got here. Um, why learn Java? Again, the number one most in-demand language around the world, number, mo number one most widely used. It's a great first language to learn. It enforces be best practices. It makes it easier to learn other languages. And one of the reasons we teach it is because very few boot camps of courses teach Java. Uh, Java is just a wonderful, fundamental first language to learn. It's just, it's, it's just ubiquitous. There's a funny video on YouTube. Um, I think it's called A Day Without Java or The World Without Java. Or actually, maybe it's called Java Apocalypse. But it basically, it's, a, it's like a, you know, a spoof parody video that shows what would happen to the world if they turned off Java or Java just disappeared. And everything stops. Phones stop working, TVs stop working, air, you know, Airplanes are falling out of the sky. Cities are going dark. It's really that ubiquitous. Java is everywhere. So learning Java is just inherently a good skill to have. Why learn Python? Well, Python is by far the number one most fastest, the number one fastest growing language right now. It's just increasing. It's having like a renaissance. Everyone's, everyone's writing Python right now. And it's understandable because it's a great, super versatile language that you can use for anything from building a very simple script to, to, to accomplish a task on your computer up to building extremely complex applications that do data science and machine learning and all kinds of stuff. Um, and Python is easy to start and it scales well. Um, as you saw in those two code samples, Python is, you know, it's, it's kind of, the word elegant comes to mind when people use, when people are talking about Python. Um, before we go here, let's see if we got IntelliJ open. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new project in IntelliJ. Um, it's just going to be a Java project. Okay, next, next. Let's call this uh, guest number. And I'm going to go ahead and save this here. Give it a moment to open up. All right, so now we're in IntelliJ, which is just a very, very simple um, ID, uh, not, not that simple, but IntelliJ is, a, is an IDE or integrated development environment. It's basically like, it's kind of like Adobe Photoshop for editing files versus some very, very basic editing that you can do in preview or something on your computer, right? So you can do some photo editing using very, very basic software, like changing the contrast and the highlights and shadows and stuff. But if you really want to get in there and do lots of uh, complicated stuff, you definitely want to be using something like Adobe Photoshop or something like it. it that's a similar analogy here. But with um, IntelliJ, we can just go ahead and, so I might have made it a little, let's go ahead and let's get rid of it out of here. Uh, 
I'm going to start that over. I'm going to say uh, create a project, and I'm not going to save it in that same directory, so it doesn't seem confusing. And let's go with, I guess, number, and we'll just do it on the desktop for right now. So what I'm going to do in here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new package because in Java we put all of our files in packages ideally, and this is going to be called guess my number, and we'll create a new Java class called guess my number. I'm going to refactor this to just guess. The package names and stuff like that are not. Um, in more complex applications, we use packages to organize our code into like sections or blocks of related material. Um, so now all I've got to do is pull my code, where is hello world.java, or guess my number.java. I'm just going to pull this code over, I'm move it here into IntelliJ. So in, in, in tell, uh, IDEs are really useful, for instance, because it tells you where you've got things wrong. So like this scanner is red right now, this next int is red right now. That's because I don't have that import statement. So as, the moment I put that import statement, which gives me this library, this scanner library to, for the, that I can now use, which is part of the Java programming language, um, now those errors go away. So now I'm in IntelliJ, and now I can just right click anywhere. Oops. And say run. And we can run it right here. So I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100. Can you guess what it is? Let's go with 50, 70, 85, 95, 90, 93, 92. I got it. I got 92 in seven tries. Um, IntelliJ IDEs are really, really useful because they give you just all kinds of functionality and um, auto completion and you can for instance you can dive down into underlying methods in the Java library and any or any other package that you're using it just makes us more productive with code just like using Adobe Photoshop makes you more productive in editing photos so let's do that same thing using PyCharm which is basically just just like IntelliJ but specifically geared towards uh, Python so let's call this uh, guest member And I'm going to do basically the same thing here, but I'm just going to create a new Python file. Let's call this guess my number. I'm going to come over here and get code. Paste it in there. Cool. And then I can right click anywhere and run this. Guess a number between 1 and 100. Let's start with 50, 25, 13, 7, 10. I got it. Number 10. Um, so this is just to demonstrate that our simple text file, which we created via the command line and can edit through Sublime Text or Text Editor or anything, we can run them from the command line using the Java or Python command. Um, and we can also pull them into really complex IDEs that allow us to do all kinds of really fancy stuff. But at the end of the day, they really just do the same thing. They, they, it's text files that we can run and interact with. So where to go from here? The um, enter. First, figure out what language intrigues you most. Do you want to do something kind of design oriented with um, where you're creating user experiences and user interfaces? interfaces? What career paths get you excited? Would you like to marry your existing skills with some software engineering knowledge? And if so, how and why? Um, read job descriptions that interest you. One of, the most, one of the best things that people have done in our courses or people that I'm working with is while they're learning, they're already doing tons of research on jobs and careers that they're interested in and companies that they're interested in. And they're reading the, you know, they'll find some company, and even if it's just a senior software engineering role that they have available as, a, as open jobs, it gives you the opportunity to see what technologies they use. Because in that job description, they're going to say, must be proficient in at least one of these languages. And they'll list out a couple and must have experience with X, Y, Z. And then you know what you need to study to get to become a good candidate for that job. Uh, we highly recommend that you take all the free courses and watch all the YouTube videos um, 
possible um, while you're starting to learn to code. Uh, Harvard has the CS50 course, which is really nice. And then once you've gotten to that point, oftentimes um, you, you, there's, you get to a point where you, you're, you've done all the tutorials, you've done all the, you've watched all the videos and you're just kind of stuck or plateaued or you don't know where to go next or you don't know how to kind of get over the current hurdle that you're currently at. Um, that is oftentimes the best time to join a bootcamp. And we tell a lot of our students the you know, if you haven't done any self-study first, go do that self-study because you'll be able to take more advantage of our course if you kind of know why you're doing what you're doing and you know why you're studying Java or Python versus JavaScript and HTML. When, you, when you've done a little bit of self-study and you've built up that internal motivation, then you can come to one of our courses and really, really take advantage of it. That being said, if you've got no experience and you're ready to take the course, we'd still love to talk to you. But we highly recommend that, you know, before you invest too much time or money or anything into making this transition into a software engineer, is that there is just an, um, an almost a limitless amount of free material and free resources and free tutorials online. And we, um, we're doing our best to contribute to that uh, with webinars like this and lots of other things. But um, there's just so much information out there to help you learn. And when you get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm really serious, I'm really motivated, I really wanna do this, and I'm ready to, I wanna do this in the next three to six months, and I want some mentorship and some accountability and some community, that's when you join a course like ours. So speaking of a course like ours, um, we have a brand new, we do in-person and online coding boot camps in Java and Python. Um, we have a brand new release of our online learning platform that we're, that we're uh, about to release in beta. And so we're offering big discounts for anyone who signs up for that, for that beta. All we basically ask is for your feedback, help us make it uh, better and um, for, for students after you. And we have got two courses, Java and SQL Associate Program and the Python SQL and APIs Associate Program. And I can, um, here's a little screenshot, but I can actually give just a brief. So I'm in, I'm in admin mode, so there's some, there's some hidden things here. But basically we have these courses that you know, break down every single aspect of, um, of the Java and Python programming languages. And then in, within each section, we've got um, kind of like this idea where you read something, watch something, and then do something. And in here, with these, you can live edit code and work with the concepts that we're talking about right in here. Uh, lots of videos, lots of documentation. And then for each section, we've got a whole, um, we've got a nice collection of labs. So um, you read through all this documentation, you watch all these videos, and you work your way through all these labs. And then each, every student for our online courses has a, has a personal mentor that you can meet with once or twice a week, depending on the program that you choose. And you can also reach out to us on our chat channels and our forums 24-7. Um, so we're basically here to help people who have decided that they're ready to take the next step and they know that they want to learn to code and they're ready to really do it. So um, some of our graduates that have come through our programs have gone on to fund, um, funded and founded their own startups, gotten jobs as junior developers, taken on more technical roles in their current careers. Up some of the places that our current student, our students, students currently work are companies like KPMG, Marketo, Experian, Philips, Universal Robots, Enterprise Engineering, and, and a number of others. It's really neat. And um, thank you for joining our speed training, Coding for Complete Beginners. If you're interested to learn more about coding or coding nomads or us, please feel free to visit us at codingnomads.co for info on upcoming courses and to apply for the limited online beta program, which we have launching uh, February 11th and March 4th in Java and Python. So thank you again for your time. I really hope this was useful for you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.